Hi everybody and welcome to Composing Layouts in React. My name is Travis Worthmeyer. I'm a senior front-end developer and the creator of Bedrock Layout Primitives, a library of components designed to make layout composition easier. Now, just like many of you, the way I was taught to write CSS, especially CSS layout, never seemed to fit well in this modern era of composable component-based frameworks. After working on two different design systems and my own layout library, I've finally learned how to write CSS in a way that no longer fights with the modern component model, but instead embraces it. I'm passionate about CSS layout and look forward to teaching you the same skills that I learned in order to build the Bedrock Layout Primitive Library. Now, composing layouts in React is for both novice and experienced developers who want to take their layout skills to the next level. I will teach you the practical skills you need to build modern layouts from web without depending on heavy CSS frameworks. Unlike courses or blog posts that teach you layout properties in isolation, I'm going to show you some practical layout patterns that you can use every day when solving your layout challenges. Now in the process, we will also recreate some of the most interesting layouts found on the wild, such as complex forms, heroes, sidebars, and responsive grids allowing you to build almost anything you need on the web quickly and easily. This course is going to be presented in four modules. In module one, we will introduce encapsulated CSS and look at how it allows us to build composable layouts. We will also be introduced to Flexbox and CSS Grid, as well as patterns of implementing encapsulated CSS. This module lays the foundation of knowledge you will need to build composable layouts with layout primitives. In module 2 and 3 we will be rebuilding the layout primitive library focusing on spacers and wrappers specifically. And finally in module 4 we will use what we learned in about encapsulated CSS and layout primitives to compose some practical layouts. Welcome to this course. I'm excited to have you here and I'll see you on the first module. What's up guys, Travis here and bringing you another lesson in composing layouts in React. Today we're going to learn about CSS and the age of components. See right now we've entered the age of components. Most front end frameworks like React use components as their foundation. There are several reasons for this, but crucially, components allow applications to be broken into simple single purpose parts that can be composed together to solve more complex needs. This is especially true when considering the layout of your web application. Unfortunately, CSS was invented to solve problems from the top down, from general rules down to more specific rules. A typical CSS style sheet is probably organized something like this, with general styles like your body up at the top, more site-wide general rules like your main nav or footer, and then more specific rules like your blog feed post, your sign up form, or your first name input. On the other hand, components encourage you to start from the bottom up, breaking your page down into more specific parts first, often in isolation from the whole, and then composing them together to build up that whole. The React docs even devote a whole section called Thinking in React that emphasizes this very point. These contradictory methodologies can lead to some frustrating decisions. It can be difficult to compose your apps using lower level components while still using CSS, which expects you to know what you're building before you've built it. Many tools have been created to help us with this problem, like SAS, LESS, CSS modules, and CSS and JS. They all solve the problem of maintaining CSS style sheets but they all fall short in one problem that tooling can never solve. And that is which component should be in charge of which styles. The answer to this question is key to making composition work, especially where web layout is concerned. By the end of this module, you'll know the answer to this question and you can start composing layouts in your web app. Hey guys, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. Today we're going to talk about actually composing layouts. So what is composition? Composition, simply put, is when you build something greater than the sum of its parts. For example, an, organ 
An organism is composed of organs, composed of organ parts, which are composed of cells, which are composed of atoms. A musical composition can be broken down to nothing more than the mass, than masterfully applying rhythm and tempo to 12 unique notes. Composition also applies to web layout. Complex layouts can be broken down into simpler layout primitives as described by Hayden Pickering. These layout primitives are single purpose layout components that do one thing and one thing well. It is by strategically combining these primitives that we combine more complex layout structures. So let's look at layout without composition. Let's take this hero layout for example. We have a menu bar on the top with a side bar with some content and some call to action and then an image on the right hand side. A naive solution, we might choose to do something like this. Have it a hero container and style that. Style the hero top, hero left, hero right, etc. There are several CSS methodologies like BEM, object oriented CSS, or atomic CSS that can help us create more consistent class names and generally are useful in managing CSS style sheets at scale. But unfortunately, these methodologies can only get you so far. When we approach our components layout as something unique for each component, we miss a fantastic opportunity to define a consistent visual structure in our application. Instead, all of our layouts would be treated as unique things that need to be built from scratch over and over again. So let's look at what layout with composition is. Instead of looking at our hero component as one isolated element, Let's break it up into smaller single purpose layout components like this. We can have a stack component that vertically stacks elements on top of each other. An inline component that horizontally stacks elements in a row. We can have a split component that splits the two children into fractions of the parent's width. We can have a cover component that covers an area and vertically centers its children and a frame component that frames out media such as images into correct aspect ratios. Now, don't worry about how these components are implemented. That's what the rest of this course is for. Just focus on the intended outcomes of what these components are trying to do. Now we can take these components, these layout primitives, and we can compose them together like this. Our menu bar is really just an inline bunch of elements. Our left hand side is a cover element that vertically centers its children. That children is a stack component where we're stacking items on top of each other. The right hand side is a frame component that frames out the media. Both of those are composed together in a split component and the whole thing is is composed together with another stack in code that would look something like this with a stack an inline our sp our split is at the same level as our as our inline and then our cover and frame are both split apart from each other and so on. These layout primitives can be applied in a sign up form, for example. They can also be assigned in a blog post feed, a feature page, or any other part of our web page. Most of the layouts we use every day are not that unique and can be broken down, at least in part, to one of a handful of layout primitives. Thinking in terms of layout composition can feel strange at first, but probably one of the more difficult parts is knowing where you should apply your style rules 
inner component. Luckily, there is a methodology that I have termed encapsulated CSS that answers this exact question, and that is what we will be learning next. What's up, guys? Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. Today, we're going to learn about encapsulated CSS. Now that we understand the power of composition when working with layouts, the next obvious question is how do we apply this in practice? One of the more important parts of building composable layouts is knowing at which level of your component tree you should be applying your styles. This is why I have compiled some important principles I like to call encapsulated CSS. Encapsulated CSS is a term I use to summarize the rules of how to apply CSS styles in a composable way. It's based on the programming principle of encapsulation. Now, here's my best attempt to define encapsulation in a language agnostic way. Encapsulation involves grouping related things and restricting access to those things except through appropriate channels. For example, many languages utilize a module system, which follows the principle of encapsulation. When you import a module like React, you get a group of functions that help you build a React application. Here we have create element, use state, use effect. All of these are part of the React namespace. However, you don't have access to the actual internals that make the React application work. Those internals are encapsulated inside of the React namespace, and only through the exposed functions can you access the React internals. In object-oriented programming, one often implements encapsulation via private properties and methods like this. Here we have a person class with two private properties called first name and last name that are marked private with that hashtag at the beginning of each of them. And then we have a constructor that takes an object with a first name and last name and assigns those values to those private properties. And then we have a, finally, we have a method that returns the last name and first name in a string. So we can create a new person like Robert Smith and we can get the name as you can see where we call get name and it returns Smith comma Robert but we can't change the actual private property because that is a private property that is not available outside of that constructor when we first knew, knew up the person class. Functional programming would probably use closures to achieve something similar. Here we have a function called the person name factory that once again takes an object with first name and last name, and it returns another function that will, when it's called, will return that same full name string. So we can call that person name factory with Robert Smith and get a function that we can call get Robert Smith's full name and when we call it we get Robert Smith's full name now, once again we still we don't have access to those values inside of that function the person name factory we only have access to call the function that is returned both of these examples you have values that are grouped together and you access them through a restricted or appropriate channel. Encapsulated CSS is based on that same principle. It's a methodology that helps you group together related styles at the correct component level and only applying styles through appropriate channels. Now, why is encapsulated CSS the key to building composable layouts? Well, the biggest enemy to composing layouts is when components already have built-in opinions on how they should be laid out. Have you ever had an element or a component that wouldn't lay out on the page the way you thought it should, only to find out that it had some built-in margin or width that was interfering with what you were trying to do? The rules of encapsulated CSS help you avoid this by showing you where to apply your styles in a way that won't conflict with the environments that, that are being used in. So the question is, how do you apply the principles of encapsulation to CSS? 
I'd like to take a step back and revisit the CSS box model. In the box model, an element is comprised of multiple layers of boxes. These boxes are wrapped around the content of our element, kind of like an onion. The first layer around the content is the padding box. Next, we have the border box, and then finally, the margin box. If I were to ask you at which layer or layers are considered part of the element and which layers are considered outside of the element, what would you say? An excellent start would be to think how elements are sized. By default, an element size is calculated based on its content plus the padding box plus the border box. For example, if you had a border of one pixel and a padding of one pixel, and then the content's inline size would be 14 pixels wide if you had a 10 pixel content. That means we have one pixel on each side for the border, one pixel on each side for the padding, and 10 pixels for the actual content, meaning 14 pixels wide in total. Now what happens if we add 10 pixels? The elements inline size or its width would still be 14 pixels. This is because margin describes how much an element pushes away from other elements, but doesn't contribute to the element's actual size. In other words, the margin layer is considered outside of the element. For further confirmation, the box sizing property, which is used to determine how the element's size is calculated, it can accept three properties, the content box, padding box, or border box. There is no margin box property. So it's pretty safe to say that the border box is the boundary of our component's encapsulation. So with that background knowledge, there are two essential principles of encapsulated CSS to consider. The first principle is components do not lay themselves out. The properties responsible for the layout of a component, like its position, size, or margin, are, the responsibility, are not the responsibility of the component itself and should not be applied at this level. So setting a display to inline, a width to 100 pixels, a margin top to two rems, or setting even the position to being relative, that is not the job of the component itself and should not be set on the component or element itself. The second principle is components style themselves and lay out only their immediate children. Properties that involve the border box and inward are considered part of the component. And those should be applied at the component level itself, as should the layout environment of the component's immediate children. Therefore, it is the parent's responsibility to set the position, size, and margin of its direct children. So things like setting the border, color, padding, or font, font family, those are appropriate to set at the component level. So today we have learned the principles of encapsulated CSS, the foundation of compositional layout. In the remaining lessons of this module, we're going to learn how to use encapsulated CSS in different layout contexts, starting with normal flow. Hey everybody, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. Today we're going to learn about normal flow as composable layouts. What happens when you do nothing to style your components? It can be easy to think that there is no layout, but that would be incorrect. CSS has a default layout called normal flow, also called block inline flow, that defines how elements interact with each other on the page. In the, this lesson, you will learn about normal flow and how it relates to composable layouts. Normal flow is simple. Block elements stack in the block direction and inline elements stack in the inline direction. Now, often we define the block and inline direction in relation to the physical screen with block elements stacking vertically and inline elements stacking horizontally. However, this is not an accurate way to think about them. 
The correct way of describing them is in relation to the writing mode. Block elements flow in the same direction that paragraphs flow and inline elements flow in the same direction that words in a sentence flow. For example, in English, the block direction is top to bottom and inline direction is left to right. However, in vertical right to left languages like those of in East Asia, the block direction is right to left and the inline direction is top to bottom. For this reason, CSS Working Group has revisited the original CSS properties based on the physical properties and has added writing mode logical variations. For example, instead of using properties like margin top, height, and width, you can now use writing mode logical variations of margin block start, block size, and inline size. By default, elements in normal flow do not position themselves. However, in normal flow, Margin and sizing properties like width and height are set explicitly on the item, which breaks the first rule of encapsulated CSS, which are items do not set their position, size, or margin. What we have to do instead is use one of two appropriate channels, which are props and the direct child selector. Now in React, we use props as input to our component, much like functions use arguments. Then our components use these props when rendering our component. Here we have exposed a label and an on click for our button component. Now, just like we expose a label or an on click prop, we can expose layout properties like margin top or min width. In our component here, we have exposed the min width property so we can set the min width directly on our component. Now, using prompts in this manner works very well with one or two properties, but it becomes unwieldy very quickly as you expose more and more properties. The props of your component should also be a reflection of what your component does. Having an arbitrary margin left prop does, doesn't make sense on a calendar component, but it might make sense as a prop used for layout. A good rule of thumb is to use this pattern sparingly and only for components that specifically are used for layout. The other channel for adding styles is using the direct child selector in the parent component. Here we have a parent class, angle bracket, and then a star, which is a wildcard to mean any element. The angle bracket is the direct child selector, or more accurately, the direct child combinator. Now this tool allows us to select any or all of our of the parent's container's immediate children and apply layout styling to it. It's important to note that there is a general child selector that looks very similar, but it should be avoided. As you notice here, the, the big difference is we're missing the angle bracket. It's that angle bracket that makes it be for direct children only. Unlike the direct child selector, this will select any child, no matter how deep below the parent class that it is. Not only does this increase the likelihood of adding unintended styles to the, to our children, but it also breaks the second rule of encapsulated CSS. Components style themselves and lay out their immediate children only. Now let's take the following blog post component. In this blog post component, we have an article with the class name blog post, uh, heading level two with the class name blog title, and then we are mapping over an array of paragraphs. Applying styles that follow the principles of encapsulated CSS, we could do something like this. We can have a blog post class and set the padding to be one rem. For all the heading level twos that are the direct children of blog posts, we can set the margin bottom and max width. For all the paragraphs that are the direct children of blog posts that also have a previous paragraph as a sibling, we can set the margin top to two rem. 
And then finally, our blog title, we can set the text transform font size and color directly on the blog title class. Now, in the above style sheet, the blog post and blog title classes are set their own styles. But when we need to set the layout properties, we use the direct child selector to select the appropriate children of the blog post class to set those properties. The blog posts that have a direct child of heading level two will only select the heading level two tags that are direct children of the blog post class. And blog posts with the direct child of paragraphs plus paragraph will only select paragraphs that are the direct children of the blog post class as well and have one paragraph that comes before it heading level two tags and paragraph tags outside of the blog post class component are not impacted by those styles and we could use those elements in any other component and none of the layout properties will follow them it's important to note that we do not use the direct child selector to add style properties only layout properties. This goes back to the second principle of encapsulated CSS that elements style themselves and lay out their immediate children. So why bother? At this point, one might ask, what's the point of going through all the ceremony of adding a separate rule for the direct children just to add a layout property? One could argue that you could write less CSS by applying the layout properties to the corresponding elements. First of all, because we didn't add any layout properties to the blog post class itself, the blog, blog post component can safely be placed in any context and not interfere with the layout environment it is being put in. The children can also now be refactored into their own components if needed, and it won't bring along the baggage of the layout environment it was initially created in. It also helps with debugging. One of the most significant diff difficulties of debugging CSS is determining where your styles are coming from. It's easier to track down styles if you have rules in place where those style properties originate. We have learned how to apply the rules of encapsulated CSS in the default normal flow layout. Now, more recently, CSS has added two other layout tools, CSS Flexbox and CSS Grid. Next, we will learn how to apply the rules of encapsulated CSS to those contexts as well. Hey everybody, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. In today's lesson, we are going to learn about CSS Flexbox and CSS Grid as composable layouts. Now, up until relatively recently, CSS technically only supported one form of layout which is normal flow, the one we learned in the last lesson. Now, developers have been hacking around this for years using tables or flows, but this often had frustrating problems since we were using tools in a way that they weren't specifically designed for. It's pretty impressive what these early innovators were able to do, but it virtually required that we use a framework like Bootstrap or Foundation to lay out anything consistently on the web. Luckily for us, this is no longer the case. CSS now has two layout options, CSS Grid and CSS Flexbox. In this lesson, we will learn the basics of CSS Grid and Flexbox and how to use them in a composable way. Now, when you set an element's display property to Grid, it does two things. First, the element becomes a Grid container and all the direct children and only the direct children become Grid items. Now in the grid container element, you can define tracks of columns and rows. Columns and row sizes can be defined either explicitly or implicitly by allowing grid to determine the height and width. The browser then places the grid items in these tracks for us, flowing left to right and then top to bottom to fill up one row at a time. Now we could write something like this, setting grid template columns to have two columns, one of 30 pixels and one of 100 pixels, and two rows of 30 pixels and then 200 pixels. So the first item is our red box, and it will go in the first column on the first row, which is 30 by 30. 
the orange box will be placed in the second column on the first row, which will be 30 by 100. And so on, our yellow gets placed in the next row in the first column. The green box gets placed in the second column in the second row. Now the last row, since we're adding something that we haven't actually defined, we now have an implicit row here. And because the largest item is our blue box, which is set to be 20 pixels high, this row will automatically be 20 pixels high to conform to the tallest row item. CSS Grid also allows you to define gaps between your row and column tracks. The gap property will put margin only between the grid items, but not between the grid items and the grid container itself. This creates the much coveted gutter effect that single with a single line of CSS. In this example, the gutters are created by using one rem gap on the parent container. Now, don't worry about the details of how grid works because we'll go over grid properties in much more detail in future lessons. Just for now, just focus on the fact that when you use display grid, the grid container places its child grid items in rows and column tracks based on the properties that you set. Now, just like CSS grid, when you set the display property on an element to be flex, the element becomes a flex container and only the direct children become flex items. However, unlike CSS Grid, CSS Flexbox only defines layouts in one track at a time. With Flexbox, you can lay out items either in rows or columns, but not both at the same time. Now by default, Flexbox will put everything in a row, but you can change that by setting the flex direction to column. Flexbox allows you to line items pretty easily. Flexbox lets you align items along the main axis and the main axis is the one that the flex direction is set to. And you can set that using the justify content property. Now you can also align items across the cross axis, which is the opposite of the flex direction axis. And this is done by setting the align items property. In this example, we are setting the main access to be flex end. So all of our content is on the end and the align items is set to center. So that way the content will center itself in the cross access. These accesses are then switched when the flex direction is set to column like this. Now you can also center items really easily by just setting the the item, the align items or the justify content to be center. Now both Flexbox and Grid follow the rules of encapsulated CSS very well. They both only lay out their direct children and not themselves. There are a few Flexbox and a few Grid properties that are set directly on the children themselves, such as Flex Grow and Grid Column Start. You can use the same pattern for these properties that we learned in the previous lesson, namely props and direct children selectors. Flexbox and Grid have been given us some fantastic tools to build composable layouts. Now, the final thing we need to do is reset the browser's user agent style sheet to compose our layouts property. And we will learn how to do that in the next lesson. What's up guys, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. In today's lesson, we will learn about CSS resets for composable layouts. Now the styles we write are not the first styles that get applied in our app. Before a single line of our CSS is used, the browser will apply their user agent style sheets. Unfortunately, there is no rule that requires any of the browsers to use the same style sheets from their user agents. For this reason, CSS resets have been a valuable tool to help developers provide consistent styling on the web. So what is a CSS reset? 
A CSS reset is nothing more than a style sheet you bring in before the rest of your app styles, either as a separate style sheet or just tagged at the beginning of, of your app styles. The style sheet's goal is simply to provide a base from which you can consistently apply CSS across browsers. Some resets are aggressive and remove all styles from all elements, while others try to normalize all the user agent style sheets of the various browsers. Luckily, there is currently less inconsistency across the browsers that would justify aggressive resets. Still, from a layout perspective, there's a need to override the browser's default styles to make it to make compositional layout possible. It makes sense to look then at what we need to reset in the browser's user agent style sheets to achieve this goal. Now in this lesson, we will be going over layout specific resets, but if you'd like to look at the complete CSS reset I use, you can check that out at Bedrock Layout Primitives and the link will be in the notes below. So first thing we need to do is set the box sizing property on all elements and pseudo elements to be border box. Setting the box sizing property to border box on all elements and pseudo elements allows for a more intuitive developer experience since the size of the elements will be calculated from border to border instead of the default, which is content, plus the padding, plus the border. Now, after that, we remove any margins from all the elements. Doing this allows elements to conform to the first principle of encapsulation, which is elements do not set their position, size, or margin. From there, we remove the padding and list styles from all list tag elements. A common thing that most people do when working with lists is remove the default padding and list styles added by the browser by default. Since this is pretty much universally done every time I style a list, I like to get it done once and get it done with. Now you'll notice we are using the attribute selector to remove the padding and list style only if the class attribute is set. Doing this will allow our list to be reset if we are actively styling the element using the class attribute. By doing it this way, our list elements will retain those default styles that make them look like lists when we use the pure list tag elements themselves. Next, we set the min block size or the min height of the body to be 100 view heights. It's helpful to have the body take up the entire viewport, even if our content does not. Next, we set our images to be block level elements instead of inline level elements, and then set their max inline size to 100%. Setting the max inline size to 100% makes our images responsive by default, and and this treats images as block level elements is something that most people do and the way they treat image tags anyway. Now, finally, we set the max inline size of text base tags to be 60 CH. A CH unit is approximately the width of the zero character of any font family that is being used. In any given font family, each character can either be very wide, like the capital W, capital w or very skinny, like the letter L. So the letter zero the, is neither the widest nor skinniest character in a font family and is a good proxy for the character width of that font family. Now we use 60CH, which is 60 characters because a large amount of research has gone into finding the optimal line lengths of readability. You can check out work done over at Material I.O. to read more about optimal line lengths, but for brevity, 60 characters is a good default cap on the inline size of the text. And there'll be links to that research at Material I.O. in the notes below. Now, with these resets in place, we have now primed the browser to let us start using the principles of encapsulation in building composable layouts. In the next module, we will start building the foundational layout primitives that allow us to build almost any of the layouts on the web. I'll see you in the next module.
What's up guys, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. In this module, we'll be learning about layout primitives. In the previous module, we learned about compositional layout and how to use encapsulated CSS to achieve that. I also introduced you to the concept of layout primitives, like stacks and splits. Layout on the web is not that unique. We can break down most of the things we do into a handful of patterns. By codifying these patterns, we now have a set of layout primitives that we can use to build the solutions we need. Over the following two modules, we will be rebuilding most of the layout primitives found at Bedrock Layout Primitives. In this module, we'll be building what I like to call spacers. Spacers are layout primitives that have a common goal of creating consistent space between elements on the page. Now, up up until this point, I have avoided using any tools. I've wanted to show you how to apply encapsulated CSS to build compositional layout using just the core technologies. In practice, however, most real-world apps use some form of tooling to make maintenance of CSS style sheets easier to manage. In the rest of this course, I will be using Styled Components. Styled Components is a library, um, specifically the CSS in JS library, explicitly built to enhance CSS and React applications. This is the same technology that Bedrock Layout Primitives is built upon, and I highly recommend using it personally. That said, nothing in the following lessons will be dependent on styled components themselves. One will be able to adapt them into SAS, LESS, or even vanilla CSS if needed. So let's get learning about the stack component our first layout primitive. What's up guys, Travis here with another lesson in composing layouts in React. In this lesson, we are gonna learn about the stack. One of the simplest and yet most common layout patterns found on the web is putting one element on top of another element with consistent space. From form labels to paragraphs of text to social media feeds, they all need to stack one thing on top of another with uniform space between them. This problem is precisely what the stack primitive solves. In this lesson, we are going to build the following widget. Uh, it's a subscribe to our newsletter widget. As you will notice, we have a few parts to this widget. There's a title section and a form section made up of two input groups and a button. The one thing that they all have in common is that they follow the same pattern. They all stack vertically with space between them. Here's the same mock-up with different space sizes pointed out. So what we need is a way to enforce that all the items will stack in the block direction no matter if they are block or inline elements by default. We also need a way to provide consistent space between the elements without creating space around the stacked elements themselves. That way the stack can remain composable in any other environment. So going forward in the rest of the lessons of this course, we are going to be using codesandbox.io. If you want to follow along, I will provide a link to a starter project that you can fork. And if you want to see the final code, there will be a link at the bottom of each and every lesson. Now let's start off with some basic markup. Uh, you can create a new file called stack.jsx. Or you can call it whatever you like. If you want to change that, just come and change it on line 7. Now, in these lessons, I'm choosing to structure my files in a way that should make it easier to focus on what's being taught. And not necessarily the way I would structure a production React app. Although React doesn't have an opinion on how to structure your files, I typically like to co-locate my components together as much as possible, and then separate the files when components are reused across other parts of the application. So I've got this copied already, so let's go ahead and just bring this in here. And of course, when I copy, I got to remember to import React 
from React. And there we go. Now the first problem we need to solve is to get the label to stack on top of our input. This problem is easily solved with a single line of CSS. And so we're going to start by creating our actual stack component. To do this, we're going to import styled from styled components. And this is already pre-installed, as you'll see. It's already installed over here. But if you haven't, it's just as simple as searching for styled components. And you can like click it on the left hand side. So let's make our first styled component called stack, which is equal to styled.div. And we're doing two back ticks. And then we're going to write our CSS in here. Display grid. Now, when we set display grid, we haven't at this point set any row or columns. So we have implicitly created a single column and it will implicitly create a new row for each element that is added inside of our stack. Now we can use our stack. We can update it like this. Let's just start off with these input groups. As you can see over here, we've already got our label and our our input to stack on top of each other. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that not only are the labels stacked on top of each other, they are also now going to take up the entire width of the column. If you want to override this behavior, you'll simply need to use justify items property on the stack mode to change all of them or use the justify self property on the individual items you want to change. In this case, we don't need to do that. Everything's working just fine. So all we need to do now is set space between them. We can set space between them using the gap property. Now the value that we add into the gap property, it can be any valid CSS size unit, such as a pixel, a percentage, or rem. To, but we don't want to just hard code it into 10 pixels, for example. What we want to do is have this configurable via props. So what we're going to use is style component string interpolation property. And I've already got this copied and it looks like this. Don't worry about the way this um, styling changes while we do that. Now, what we're doing here, let's take a step back. We already know about JavaScript string um, template property, which is within two back ticks. You can create a string. For example, let's let's go const age equals fifty, and we go let age string equal. Let's put it into back text, and we're gonna say you are and. We'll, we're going to want to do some type of decision here. We want to say you are old if you're over 45 and young if you are 45 or less. So here we can go age is greater than 45. If that's the case, we're going to say you are old. Otherwise, we're going to say you're young. And then here we're going to console.log age string. Now, 
code sandbox io if you've never used it before let's refresh that so we can clear some of those errors you can hear, see it says you are old down here and if we go ahead and change this to 30 now it says you are young now this is the default way that a regular template literal works is that everything inside of this dollar sign curly and then a final curly it gets it breaks out of the string mode and it evaluates it and then we go back into string mode for the rest now there are things called tag template literals now and that's exactly what this is is a tag template literal which is a way to custom parse that javascript expression so we can actually have more control over what's going on inside of the dollar sign curly instead of just evaluate whatever it gets handed to us so when we are using style.div and we break into this curly we actually have the option to pass in a function and that function oops that function has access to the props that we pass into this component and we can return a string that will ultimately be used in our CSS so in this specific example we are taking the props and we are going to if we have provided a props dot gutter we will evaluate that and return whatever string is passed into the gutter prop but if we don't pass in a string to the getter prop, we're going to default to one rem. That way there's always some gap in between our items. So once again, now we can actually do a little bit more. Let's take, for example, these inputs. We don't want them to just have the default one rem, as you can see, it's already been given over there. We want to give them, let's give them a gutter. Equal to 0 0.25 rem or one quarter rem. That's a little bit closer. It's a little bit more realistic to what an input group would have. Now, we also need in between here and here, we need to have a gutter. So let's put on, let's call, put stack there. And you can see now this is a stack. This group is stacked on top of this group, which is stacked on top of this button. And each one has a one rem gutter place in between them. Uh, let's do the same thing with the with the our uh, heading level two in our paragraph. And let's don't just go with the default gutter. Let's give it a gutter equal to um, 0 0.5 rem. And we're, we're doing awesome here. Now we just need to get a bigger gutter here. Now something probably bigger than the default. So let's put a stack around the entire thing. And that's pretty good, but we want a little bit bigger here. So in this case, let's go twice as big. Let's go two rem. There we go. That looks a lot better. So now we have a component that will universally stack all of its children and will separate them via a configurable value that's passed into the gutter prop. We could stop here. This does exactly what we want, but I'm going to recommend one more treat, one more tweak, I should say, sorry, to this gutter prop. Right now we are allowing any value to be passed into this gutter, but for consistency is best practice to adopt some type of spacing scheme 
when you're laying out items on the web. Choosing a good spacing scheme is beyond the scope of this course. And I'm not a, not a designer, so I'm not going to go into like all the different methodologies to create a spa spacing scheme. Also, if you work with a design team, they probably already have a spacing scheme set up in their style guide that they're using. But let's just create a spacing scheme. Um, in Bedrock Layout Primitives, we, there's a spacing scheme that's based on t-shirt sizes and it looks something like this. I just copied it. So we're creating an object here called spacing map and we have some different sizes the large for example is one rem medium is half a rem and so on and so forth so instead of just accepting any value that gets passed in here let's adjust it like this so spacing map and we're going to pass in the prompts dot gutter and then we're going to default to oops to the large now by the way I kind of gloss over this earlier if you're not aware of what these double um, hooks or double um, qu question marks mean. This is called a null knowledge coalescing operator. If this evaluates to anything that's nullish, meaning null or undefined, then it will go to this value as a backup. But if this does evaluate to something, then this is ignored. So what happens is we can pass in a prop to our gutter. And if that gutter prop, if that key is not inside of the spacing map, then it will just default back to a one round gutter. And you can see based off the way, since we haven't changed anything yet, that's what's happened is everything is now one rem over here. So let's update our component and just with the power of copy and paste, because I've already have it available, uh, we can get the same exact thing to work exactly how we did before. But instead of passing in the values directly, now we're passing in properties like extra large, medium, small and this gives a little bit more um, description to what these spacing values are in relation to each other and that's it we are we're done um, at the end of the lesson there is a link to the the sandbox with all the code and and that's it. So now that we have our stack items, we need to now fall kind of, we need to fix the most common problem besides stacking, which is putting one thing next to the other. So in the next lesson, we're going to learn about the split layout primitive. We'll see you on the next lesson.